Thank you very much uh, to Swiss Re for hosting this event and to Fiona and the BMJ for really the vision for doing this. Uh, Nita and I, I guess maybe now two years ago, started having these conversations with, with uh, Fiona about doing something on food and I think this is really exciting. And, and I will say that our, our, our input fr from the beginning was that this series of papers and the, like this conference should not be sort of book chapters that just kind of repeat you know, one point of view, but really bring together co-authors um, that may not agree with each other and really talk about what we don't know in addition to what we do know. Um, so the paper I'm going to talk about, I, I wrote with Ricardo Huawei and Erwin uh, er er Rosenberg, who are really um, uh, you know, thought leaders for many decades in nutrition. And I want to talk a little bit about the story of, I think, how we got uh, where we are today in terms of nutrition science. Um, I, and I think that as Swiss Re uh, um, knows and has highlighted that we really are facing a global nutrition crisis. And I don't use the word crisis lightly here. I think it's, it, if you really actually just look at the numbers, this is one of the biggest issues facing the globe. Uh, poor diet is now the single leading cause of poor health in the world, uh, exceeding tobacco smoking. That's mostly from chronic disease, but also, of course, from undernutrition and micronutrient deficiencies. So if you care at all about health, if health is any uh, of importance to your business or to you personally, food should be the top issue you are thinking about. And contrast that to healthcare systems around the world that are largely ignoring food. Um, this is also a, a major issue for disparities. This isn't the only issue driving disparities, but this is a major issue for disparities. Disparities. People who are poorest in every country in the world have the least access uh, to, to healthy food, and that drives a vicious cycle of, of disparities. Um, I mentioned healthcare costs. This is in the United States, you know, uh, crushing uh, businesses and crushing government uh, costs. Um, and, and this is really important for economic growth. A really nice Institute of Medicine report a few years ago said that the rise of chronic disease is, uh, is a huge challenge for middle income countries because of, of crushing costs. And I think that the Chinese economy is going to have enormous problems in the next 20, 30 years because of their rising uh, chronic diseases. Sustainability and climate change, not a part of this series, but, but incredibly important. Our food system, I think, is the number one overall threat to sustainability and, and climate, water use, land use, uh, CO2 equivalent um, uh, production, and so forth. And also national security, and this isn't an issue that is discussed often, but um, national sec food and national security have been linked for millennia. And you know, both the birth of the RDAs um, from the uh, uh, League of Nations and the British Medical Association and the, the IOM in the 1940s, the US National School Lunch Program, all of those things in the 1940s were because of, of national security around World War II, and we forget that. Uh, and now we have a new national security crisis in Western countries because of, of chronic diseases. And there's a group in the United States called Mission Readiness 700 retired admirals and generals who have been writing about this and talking about this for a decade, that poor nutrition is causing national security crises. So all of these things put together, I think this is one of the single biggest challenges facing the globe. And in contrast to those other challenges like violence or prejudice, um, we actually can figure out within a decade how to fix most of this. We have the science actually to fix most of this. So I'm incredibly optimistic that we can move forward. So the public gets this in a deep, deep way, in a way that I haven't seen in my entire career. And this is across the world. And so there's incredible passion, but there's also confusion. This is an opportunity for moving forward. And the science has exploded. Um, and this is kind of what our piece is about, is that modern nutrition science is less than 100 years old. And if you look at the science of diet and, and chronic diseases, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and so forth, the science is doubling every decade. This is the list of publications every decade. And orange is just the first half of this decade. So the science is moving remarkably quickly. And we know so much more now than we did just 20 or 30 years ago. And we have to be sure that the science intersects with policy. At, at Tufts, our school is the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. That's not accidental. We think that you know, science without policy is just kind of stale knowledge from bench to bookshelf. Um, and policy without science is dangerous. And so these things really have to be brought together. And right now, nutrition policy around the world doesn't always link and often doesn't link with, with uh, the, the best science. 
And I'll just give you a couple of examples. These are brand new policies. The UK front, front to pack traffic light label, just a few years old, and the Chile black box warning labels, just, just uh, less than a year old. Very, very reductionist focus on foods, picking single nutrients. Both of them have calories. They focus on, on very reductionist approaches to defining health. And I think this is actually not the best approach. Um, and th this is also the current global paradigm for addressing obesity, count your calories. It's all about energy in, energy out. It's all about energy balance. Um, and just people should be moving more and eating less. Also, I think, actually deeply flawed and potentially harmful. So why are we so infatuated with these reductionist approaches? Um, we sort of go through this uh, in, in our paper. We talk about modern nutrition science, again, is, is so new. We don't really realize how, how new this is. The first isolation and synthesis of a vitamin was in 1932 with vitamin C. That was the first time a vitamin was isolated and synthesized. And that was the first time then that you could prove that a vitamin cured or, or caused a disease. And in this case, the disease was scurvy. So it wasn't it was less than 100 years ago. We just have to remember how recent that was that we actually showed that a, a dietary compound could pure, cure or prevent a disease in a very objective, rational way. And over the next 20 years, there was this explosion of, of discovery and isolation and synthesis of all the known major vitamins. And the accident of history was the Great Depression and World War II, which led to huge attention on food shortages and, and deficiency, right? So this combination of science and geopolitics led to this massive idea about we got to get enough nutrients into people to prevent these diseases. And it led to this idea of food as a delivery system, um, the idea of commodity crops, exploding commodity crops to get, to get calories to people, fortification. And then when chronic disease started to be considered in the 1950s and 1960s, as I'll talk about, the reductionist approach continued. Is it fat? Is it sugar? That was the debate of the 50s and 60s. It was a, a real debate at that time. So the reductionist approach works very well for single nutrient deficiency diseases. It works perfectly well for scurvy or beriberi or pellagra. But what we've learned since 2000 is that the reductionist approach doesn't work for obesity, for diabetes, for cancer, for, for cardiovascular diseases. It falls apart for, for chronic disease. And so understanding that this is really just the entire first half of the last century um, and, and explains a lot about how we got where we are. Um, the next 20, 30 years continued this uh, uh, approach, this reductionist approach. So when we started thinking about heart disease and coronary heart disease in the 1970s, people said, well, what's the nutrient that's causing coronary heart disease? And it must be fat and saturated fat and dietary cholesterol. That's what's causing cardiovascular disease. And if we get rid of that, we can eliminate it. And that reductionist approach is continuing now, as I mentioned, with our focus on obesity. It's all about calories. We just have to count calories rather than thinking about complexity. Um, in developing countries, there was a, a, a huge debate in the, in the 70s about whether malnutrition was due to protein, a protein problem, or a calorie problem. And this was actually you know, maybe forgotten now, but a lot of debate back and forth. But while it was going on, the protein folks were sort of winning the day, and industry followed. And so industry made an enormous number of complementary foods and infant formulas that were high in protein and high in vitamins and flooded the markets of those low-income countries with these protein-enriched, fortified foods. And, and the history of this, as, as people may know, has not always you know, been so ethical in how those companies marketed and promoted those, those, those foods. Um, and then, of course, the dietary guidelines continued these reductionist approaches in 1980, the first dietary guidelines in the US to really focus on chronic disease. It was largely nutrient-focused. Um, uh, Low-income countries are around the same time, 1980s and 1990s, people started thinking about poverty and, and economic advancement, but somehow that reductionist focus wasn't forgotten, and people still thought it's all about getting enough calories to people and getting micronutrients into, into them through pills or through food fortification. And of course, industry has followed this. And, and when I say food industry, we think about manufactured foods, but we should remember food industry is agribusiness, multinational supermarkets and retailers, multinational restaurants, and food manufacturers. And I don't blame industry for doing this. This is what we told them to do, right? This is what science and public health told them to do. Industry followed what we asked them to do. They made a plethora of foods that were rich in calories, starch and sugar, that were shelf stable, and were fortified with, with vitamins. And so Special K is kind of the classic example, and that's the, you know, one of the older cereal boxes, right? It's cornstarch. It's just cornstarch with 
a whole bunch of vitamins, and people think of it as a healthy cereal. Baked potato chips, chocolate, skim milk, low-fat turkey sausage, fat-free salad dressing. Like, that's an oxymoron, right? Salad dressing must have oil in it. So if it's fat-free, what's in it, right? Starch, salt, and sugar, right? So we're putting starch, salt, and sugar on our salads in instead of some of the healthiest fruit and nut oils that, that we can imagine. So what have we learned since then? Why am I saying these were all a mistake? Well, I think we've learned an enormous amount about chronic diseases really since the 2000s. And of course, there was decades of foundational science before this that was important. I mean, if we didn't have the studies of Ansel Keys and others um, in the 80s and the 90s, we wouldn't have been able to get where, where we are today. But much of what we know, I think, has really accumulated since 2000. And what we know now is for chronic diseases, chronic diseases are not a single nutrient deficiency diseases. They're, they're complicated. Um, they're multifactorial. And the influence of, of diet on them is complex and multifactorial. We have to think about foods and their, their, their complex matrices. So you know, instead of thinking about saturated fat, we have to think about all the food sources that, that fat comes from. Instead of thinking about dairy as a class, we have to say, well, there's yogurt, there's cheese, and there's milk, and they're all actually very different foods. And even among those foods, it may make a difference if the milk is homogenized or not homogenized in terms of milk fat globule membrane and bioactive phospholipids. It may make a difference if it's a hard cheese that's fermented or a soft cheese that's not fermented. There's enormous complexity. And so that complexity is crucial to understand. And at the same time, in developing countries, right, we shouldn't just talk about the industrialized world. The complexity of food has finally gotten to the, to the uh, 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 international stage, where it's not just about starch and micronutrients anymore. It's about diet quality and trying to assess diet quality, diet diversity, and addressing the double burden. As you know, the double burden is the presence of chronic diseases like obesity and diabetes and hunger in the same communities, in the same family, and most often in the same people, in the same individuals in those low-income countries. So that's kind of where we are now, is this, this complexity of foods and diet patterns and how to address the double burden globally. And this is kind of my you know, sort of cartoon about what I think we know um, right now about what the dietary priorities should be, what the policies should be, should be focused on. There's foods that are really good for us, and we should be trying to flood our bodies and the food supply with those foods. There's foods that are kind of neutral, a little bit better, a little bit worse for different reasons. Cheese is a little bit better because of its links to lower diabetes. Unprocessed red meat's a little bit worse because of its links to higher risk of diabetes. And there it's likely the heme iron, not the fat. It's about the heme iron in the meat that's likely the problem. And then the worst thing in the food supply is grains, starches, sugars, processed meats, and very, very high uh, uh, foods with very high additives like sodium and trans fat. So everything in moderation is absolutely the wrong message for, for the globe. The foods in the middle, we should eat in moderation. I agree with that. The foods at the top, we should eat in excess. And the foods at the bottom, we should minimize. Right? That's the approach to, to solving our global crisis. Um, so where are we going? Where do, where do we think that um, the future of nutrition science is going and the, how that will, will that influence policy? So I think these are kind of five big areas that, that, we, that we, we talk about. First is all of the complex interactions and interrelationships of, of foods that we're just, just starting to scratch the surface of and I think are going to be incredibly important. So probably maybe most important is, is diet and the microbiome. Maybe everything we eat, in a sense, is either a prebiotic or a, or a probiotic, um, and, and we're really feeding our gut for health. Um, also, related to that, but also for their own biologic effects, the effects of trace compounds in foods that we haven't really paid attention to, like specific fatty acids, flavonoids, uh, the effects of fermentation that I mentioned. Um, the effect of diet composition rather than calories on, on weight gain, um, and the powerful influence, which we're, again, just scratching the surface of, of social influences like place, where you're born, and your social status, how that links to your food and to your diet and, and, and to future health. Um, second big bullet, quality, not quantity. For, for preventing the obesity, uh, uh, for solving the obesity challenge that's facing the world, we have to stop counting calories and focus on diet quality. That means defining diet quality which is also something that's you know, not straightforward, but we know enough to start to do that, and I think that's really crucial. Processing and additives, I mean, the public talks about processed foods being bad for you. I don't think processing per se is bad for you, but there's, there's gotta be optimal processing and harmful processing, and I don't think we really quite understand of all the things that the food industry is doing, what are the things that are really actually meaningful and important that, that's optimal or not? Is oil de deodorization a bad thing? Is homogenization of milk 
a bad thing, is, uh, and answering and understanding uh, the, these questions. Also additives. Um, and when we think about processing and additives, uh, I don't just mean, again, food manufacturers, all the ways we breed our crops and the way our crops have changed over time. Does it really make a difference if, if beef is grass-fed or not? I don't think so. I don't think the evidence suggests it makes a difference for health, whether beef is grass-fed or not, but there's just not that much science yet. Um, diet risk pathways, I'll show you a slide. I think this is another area for the future. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. And then public health, I'll come back to that in, in a minute as well. Um, so again, just a summary of some of the trials that have been done in humans showing that when it comes to long-term risk of obesity, it's not about energy, it's about quality of the diet. That the types of foods we eat influence through really interesting, complex, unconscious mechanisms all of the pathways related to, to weight control. Not just hunger, we think about hunger, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Glucose and insulin and hormone responses, fat synthesis in the liver, brain reward and craving, the gut microbiome, and even metabolic expenditure. Now there have been at least a couple of trials showing that diet composition may influence metabolic expenditure. So all calories are not the same when it comes to long-term risk of obesity. Um, complex pathways, I mentioned this, um, you know, almost Every aspect of, of foods and diets affects a range of risk factors, and if you put it all together, all of these have been documented in human trials, food affects almost every major pathway you can think of related to health in the body. And we had blinders on in the 80s and 90s, and we're focused on blood lipids because we're worried about middle-aged men getting heart attacks, and that led to the low-fat, low-saturated fat, low fat uh, uh, focus. And now I think we have blinders on or we're just focused on obesity, so we just talk about calories. And I think food is much more complex and its effects are much more complex. And, and the future is going to be kind of putting all of this together to think about effects of foods. Uh, I think the areas of research I mentioned are incredibly important. I, I went over these already. These are, I think, major areas for the future. Uh, and I think also when we think about research, I think that we have to understand how to put the evidence together. And I think we're still at the earliest stage. Um, I very strongly believe from all of my training that thinking that randomized controlled trials are the pinnacle of evidence is a, is a flawed uh, approach. And that's still kind of the current uh, uh, approach. And I think John uh, Unidos is going to speak this evening, and I'm sure that's what he's going to say. That is flawed. Randomized controlled trials have key strengths. They also have key limitations. Every line of research inquiry has strengths and limitations, and those are complementary. And so really, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy should say, look at all the evidence. Understand the strengths and limitations of every single kind of study design. Put it together in a thoughtful and informed way. Don't just say, let's do mega randomized trials and assume that's going to give us the, the answers. I think this is an area for, for, for the future. And then lastly, I think one of the major areas for science is, is the science of behavior change. For too long, we've focused on nutrition in terms of chronic disease risk and said it's about behavior change in, at the individual level, it's about knowledge, it's about education, we have to explain to people what to eat, how do we get people to understand, you know, all of the focus we have on labeling, on education, on guidelines. And it's sort of shocking to me, this is the only major part of the globe's economy that we leave up to the individual to determine whether or not to do something safe, right? The building we're in has enormous numbers of codes, right? If we walk into this building, we assume it's safe. We assume that it has fire codes, earthquake codes, the cars you drive, right? You assume there's a minimum level of safety. The toys we buy for our children, imagine if all the toy stores in the world had really, really unsafe toys that everybody knew were unsafe sort of average toys that were a little bit unsafe and then safe toys. And we said, look, we have to, and there, and there were thousands and thousands of kids per day getting injured or dying from these toys. And all we did was say, well, we have to explain to the parents, you know, which toys are safe so they go and buy the safe toys, right? And, and tell them to shop at the toy section around the outside of the toy section. Don't go in the middle aisles of the toy <laughs> section, right? Like the stuff we do for food is just sort of mind-blowing, right? All food should be healthy. All food should be safe from a, from a disease perspective. And I think to do this, it's going to be about policy, it's going to be about innovation, and it's going to be about culture. And the food industry is absolutely a part of the solution, right? They're not the enemy, they're part of the solution. We have to trust but verify. Um, and we have a list of Best Buy policies that we're working on, uh, mostly focused on the United States. We have a Food is Medicine initiative working with the U.S. government. Uh, there's now a 
a working group in the U.S. House called the Food is, the Food is Medicine Working Group, um, which is really exciting that there's a group in the, of, of congressmen in the House talking about food as medicine and its influence. Um, these are the kind of the spectrum of domains, I think, that, that will work. Um, it may be a little bit different in low-income countries, but I think this would also be very uh, appropriate for middle-income countries. So I just want to end and say that you know, it's really important to just look back at the last 100 years of history and sort of see how we got to where we are today. It will really helps us know where we're going. As Carl Sagan said, you have to know the past to understand the present. And as Martin Luther King Jr. said, we are not makers of history, we are made by history. So uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion and the breaks and uh, to a, a panel that I'm on tomorrow.